Welcome, uh, one and all, to this, the second session in our cultural conversation series. May I begin by thanking you all for your patience and continued engagement with the cultural conversation series, despite recent scheduling setbacks. This series is designed to promote the arts and culture and explore their power within society. It is a key part of my mayoral theme, global UK, trade, innovation and culture, a theme which seeks to build a well-rounded Britain which can play a significant role on the global stage. In our current crisis, it is more important than ever to be supporting our cultural institutions and creative sector. It has been a revelation to see how London's cultural organisations have responded over the last few months. Many people depend on the creative arts as an emotional outlet. And during this stressful time, the online output has been staggering and has offered a platform for that outlet. The subject of today's discussion is designing a museum for London's future, an exploration of the ways in which museum directors and architects work together to create visionary projects. We are honored to have the directors of not just one, but of two of London's world-class museums talking this evening. Tim Marlowe, director of the Design Museum and Sharon Ament from the Museum of London. Thank you in advance to Tim for chairing this discussion and to Asif Khan and Sharon for taking part. Now I'd like also to thank John, John Sadinsky and the Genesis Foundation for supporting this series. This discussion really couldn't come at a better time. Just yesterday, much to huge amounts of excitement, the Museum of London received planning permission for their new home in West Smithfield. The new museum project will redefine what it means to be a 21st century museum for London and will reach existing and new audiences through vibrant programming, its unrivaled London collection and dynamic storytelling. It is all very exciting. Before we begin today, we do have a little housekeeping to attend to. I've noticed that many of you have already said hello via the Zoom chat, giving your name and organization or area you represent. It's great to see so many of you signing in. Please note that the chat will go dark once Tim and the panel begin. Though the chat will not be visible, you may still submit questions to the moderator via this feature. At the end of this conversation, we will open the discussion to questions from the floor and questioners will be invited to join the webinar, after which John Sadzinski from the Genesis Foundation will give some closing remarks. Now, I hope today's conversation leaves you with all with much food for thought. And if you enjoy today's discussion, please be sure to join us at our third cultural conversation in September on the subject of philanthropy and the arts. But without further ado, let us begin. I'm delighted to introduce our chair for this evening, CEO and director of the Design Museum in London, Tim Marlowe. Over to you, Tim. William, thank you very much. And uh, thanks to everyone. There's a lot of chat going on already, which I'm excited about. And we look forward to receiving your questions in about 50 minutes. Um, as William said, the conversation is designing a museum for London's future. It's clearly predicated on the exciting proposition that in 2024, there will be a new Museum of London opening in West Smithfield. But it's also an excuse and a springboard to discuss how museum directors and architects work together to create visionary projects and also the broader role that museums play in placemaking and in the future of cities. So joining me in these discussions, Asif Khan, one of the leading architects of his generation anywhere in the world, an architect whose practice is described as research and development based and actually spans everything from buildings and landscape to exhibitions, installations and interventions. He's done uh, already in a career that's only been going as an official practice since 2007, three pavilions associated with the Olympics, one Serpentine House, he's been contem a contemporary arts and culture centre in Kazakhstan. He was one of six architects listed from a, a long list of 2000 applicants for the new Muse Guggenheim Museum in Helsinki when he was unknown. Since when he's got an MBE and perhaps more illustriously is a uh, trustee of the Design Museum, that wonderful mm. museum other side of London, uh, in West London. Um, joining him uh, is Sharon Arment, who's director of the Museum of London, who's been in post for eight years now. Formerly, she was mm. director 
public engagement at the Natural History Museum. She's part of the Mayor's Cultural Strategy Group. She sits on the board of London's uh, Arts Council. She's also a pivotal person in a group to establish a cultural hub in the City of London that involves partnerships with the Guildhall School of Music and Dance, the City of London Symphony Orchestra at the Barbican, and of course, her own museum. Now, Sharon, you've um, obviously been spending a long time developing yeah. a vision and you've got till 2024 to crystallise it. Um, you've got a mere 450,000 years of human history to engage with in your museum, <laughs> 7 million objects, and you've got a rapidly changing city, as all cities are, but probably few more than London right now. So, it's a tough ask, but I'm still going to ask you, could you just set out where your vision is now for the museum so that we can then start to unravel the relationship of the new museum and how it's informing your vision and how it's informed by your vision. Yeah, um, our, our, our ambition, and I think it is a collective, it's not my ambition, it's our ambition, um, which really marks this project out, is to create a new museum for London. So this really isn't the Museum of London moving house. It is a total transformation. And we're kind of, we're kind of referring it uh, to it as a shared space in the middle of it all, in the middle of 2000 years of history, in the middle of big ideas, in the middle of creativity, literally in the middle of it all, right in the center of London, right next to a wonderful um, transport hub. You know, that, this means that our, we, you can come to the Museum of London and be, be just two train stops away from Paris or from uh, Amsterdam. So really in the centre. And, and we would be blind if we don't recognise that, and certainly at the moment, society is demanding more and more from its cultural institutions. It's demanding more participation, more collaboration, more empathy, more uh, understanding, more evidence and more ideas. And the design that we are landing on, and I'm using a very active verb because we are still in the process, is, is, is evolving to absolutely meet that demand. And if I was to say I couldn't think of a better project for these times, then it is the Museum of London at West Smithfield. And we started this process in 2015, when we kind of landed on this place, this complex of buildings in West Smithfield, which is a market, um, almost by chance. Um, but since then, and driven by a set of values, we are constantly making choices. And uh, Asif and the architectural team, Stanton Williams and Julian Harrop are an example of how we chose a choice that we made based on values. And together as a massive team, we are, have been kind of understanding, unpicking, disinterring, interrogating ourselves and the set of buildings that pre-existed, that pre that exists now, but had a different life to create and to iterate a new museum that best responds to uh, society and to the needs of uh, the, uh, a museum. Uh, and it's helping us to become and to be a different organization. Um, in essence, to be what I think we could be, which is the most open, the most accessible, the most exciting mashup between a city and a museum that there could possibly be. I think it's very, it's very um, articulately put and very exciting as a museum director myself, the idea to spend a long time formulating where you want the museum to go and what you want it to be with not just your curatorial team, but with mm. stakeholders in the, the place and also with architects. Mm. Um, I, I also um, respond very, very strongly to the idea that architecture is a collaborative venture anyway. And Asif, I know you're a an architect who always stresses the team aspect of your own practice but you are as Sharon's just mentioned and I was going to articulate part of a team which is led by Paul Williams and Stanton Williams uh, the distinguished architect Julian Harrap who does a lot of great conservation work is also involved now let's talk about teamwork and how that works but let me also cynically say that uh, Sharon may have pulled a blinder because she can control by dividing and ruling where are the pressure points or is it really a utopian uh, situation where you're all sitting in seminars hammering out wonderful visions for what a museum could and should be and will be in the future? <laughs> well, 
<laughs> yeah, so Sharon, Sharon, of course, is the is a fantastic leader for all of us. She's an inspiration, and, and I think her what she just expressed is something that we all feel and we feel privileged to be part of. Um, I think London, uh, I think all of us would say London's on a kind of, well, maybe global cities are on a, a turning point at the moment. And uh, to be creating a cultural institu institution which can bake in new values and new ways of experience public, experiencing public space, I think is, is um, a kind of once in a lifetime opportunity. As a, as a design team, we, as you mentioned, there, there are three kind of um, leads and, and Stanton Williams are the other kind of, um, kind of the, 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 the top architects and we have the collaboration with them and myself, uh, Asif Khan Studio, and then we have Junior Harrop architects who are the, the conservation architects. And uh, all of us have different experiences. All of us are uh, based in London and believe in um, the possibilities that a cross-generational collaboration can release. And it's something that hasn't really happened before. If you think about it, um, the last big cross-generational co collaboration was probably the United Nations building. We had Corbusier and Oscar Niemeyer in 1947. Uh, it came out of a big crisis of the Second World War. And, uh, and those, they brought together, I think, 12 architects from around the world to try and hash out what the new vision of the uh, future could be and how architecture could manifest ideals of a kind of shared, uh, unified um, ideology for the world. And I think we're doing something uh, for London that's like that, you know, manifesting uh, Sharon's ideas, the ideas of the curatorial team, this amazing collection. Um, and as in 1947, um, there are little uh, uh, different positions that we take. There are sort of, uh, there are times that we, uh, you know, we become biased ourselves on certain ideas. We kind of, we, we challenge each other endlessly. Um, I think we're learning off each other. We, 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 we you know, every, every, uh, uh, every month it's like opening a new chapter and this is really exciting for, mm -hmm. for a small studio um, with 25 people, okay, medium sized, and for a larger studio like Paul's, we, we learn of each other and I think this shared energy we hopefully bring to the team and, and eventually to the visitors who come to the museum. Mm -hmm. You know, we want the audience to feel the energy and love and enthusiasm we've put into this over the last four years. Mm -hmm. You're so diplomatic. Of course there are arguments, but I love the fact that you're not going to be drawn on that one. I mean, creative tension is obviously a, a good thing, um, bro broadly speaking. Sharon, where, how do you move towards something um, that's both fluid, but at the same time is fixed in the sense that you've got to get a building delivered, you've got three very strong-minded, uh, talented groups of architects. Uh, how close are you to that? And, and, and do you have the final say? I, I suppose I do, yes. but. Um... But it doesn't feel like that sometimes, <laughs> uh, and and that's a good thing. You know, I don't. We don't employ people. We don't work with people to deliver our vision. If I if we had done that, we would have ended up with a really not a very good um, design, and it is still a process ongoing. Um, and I'm always surprised. You know, we'll go away with an issue. Uh, issues are happening all the time. Give me an example. Uh, Give us uh, an example. Okay, we need the latest, the recent, most recent one. We uh, we gave um, we need <laughs> to uh, look after, and this will be close to William Russell's heart, the Lord Mayor's coach, uh, and it's a fantastic object which we want to put on show in a new and exciting way. Um, it has it's a, it's an 18th century working coach. Every year it goes out around the city of London with the new incoming Lord Mayor. Um, so it's really remarkable and there's all sorts of conditions around that. And we need to care for it in a particular way, but yet show it to its best ability, to its best, in its best way. Um, so we said to Asif, who was creating this space in the general market, in an area which we call our time, Asif, can you build an environmentally controlled box kind of thing? That's, all, that's the only way in which we could articulate it. And I have to say, Asif and the team were like, oh my goodness, we have these wonderful creative ideas to do this, this and this. Do we have to do that? And we, and we say, yes, you do. And they kind of like, oh, okay then. And you can say more about your process. But in the end, um, this is what surprises me. What has evolved? 
is the most magnificent potential solution to a problem which we didn't, which we had to kind of tackle. But it's all the design process and the creativity from Asif and his team that have come up with a magnificent uh, resolution. We just now need to find the additional money to put it in. <laughs> problem number two. <laughs> Actually, it sounds like it sounds like a wonderful combination of a kind of climate control display case and a garage. Um, <laughs> we should charge. We should. We should have a parking meter there. Maybe, maybe uh, William can. Um, can <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, uh, no, they're all they're ready for being funded, of course. I suppose that what's interesting there is, you know, we we I want to get onto placemaking, mm. uh, and placemaking not just yet, but in a minute. And placemaking has a kind of if not a macrocosmic view, it certainly has a, a big, a broader picture. Sharon's just given us a great example of how a microcosmic problem needs solving. Uh, that must be a, a, an interesting tension because so many buildings are devised as a kind of overall vision that's then parachuted in. It seems absolutely clear, both from this conversation already, mm. but also just the structure of architecture and, and what we've heard, that that isn't the case, that you're working in a multiplicity of different mm. ways at the same time. Mm. Uh, I mean, we, we're, we're, uh, as, as I, you know, as, as I said earlier, we're, we're a team with, with, with different outlooks and different sort of um, approaches to design. The building that we are inheriting is like a campus, actually. It's not a single building. It's, it's sort of three buildings and an enormous basement, which will be is one of London's great hidden treasures it's it's the old uh, great northern railway um, um, goods goods shed which delivered meat back and forth to, to the general to the to the Smithfield meat market so imagine this underground space that trains were going back and forth delivering goods and the, the building itself has a train track through its basement that you'll be able to see a live train moving through um, delivering passengers Thames link line um, so it is um, there are microcosms within it you know there are worlds um, and, and, and views kind of it's a city within a city you could say and this gives a great opportunity to not only come up with new ideas but like basically collaborate with the original architect of the building so that's Horace oh. Jones who's you know who's a sort of silent partner in the project you know he's uh, 18 uh, you know 1890s yeah another architect uh, and you know we're discovering if you, if you sort of um uh go down to the basements with Julian Harrop and, and you know, there'll be areas which they're slowly uncovering um, vaults and, and just, you know, uh, areas which, which have been forgotten about, which are part of railway infrastructure and so on. And, and you know, there's a question of, um, do those become part of the museum? Do they become future places to expand into? Um, and, you know, if you go onto the, the rooftops, you know, brick by brick, cobblestone, you start to decode how that building has behaved over, over hundreds of years, you know, last 150 years. And, and really, which of those things are worth um, communicating and, and highlighting for the, mm. for the current generation of people? Which of those are important stories for a museum of today? Um, and so mm. that, that's, that's a really interesting discussion that we're constantly having between, um, let's say, curatorial practice. I, I, what I mean by that is that the building is the biggest artifact in the collection yeah. um, and how you remember history, but also how you kind of don't let that inhibit how you think about the future. Mm. I think Sharon sorry go yeah. yeah and I would like I'd like to point out that I think together we have discovered that the the very nature of the market itself has is an extraordinary as a building as a place with all that functionality that it has as a market is really uh, combines the components for an exceptionally modern museum and and it relates to operation how we, you know we we as a museum will have to change our operations in this building to make the most of those opportunities so for instance having multiple entrances most museums are not used to that being very porous and flowing in and out now that means we're going to have to really change our operations um, to respond to that. And it became a kind of driving imperative almost to live up to the potential of the buildings. The, it's really interesting, the, the idea that the building itself is an artifact. I mean, as someone who's director of a museum where design is the subject, but also people come to the building and the design mm -hmm. is prominent in the building itself. That's a, that's, that's a challenge, but it's a wonderful opportunity too. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so obviously the fabric of, of a particular building in London you can you can play with. What about time though? Because I, I mentioned at the beginning you have this vast span of human time, and I've read somewhere that you you've got categories of deep time, past time, our time, mm -hmm. real time, imagined time, which it, it, that's great. Uh, but is will that form discrete elements? discrete buildings, discrete structures, where you'll be going from deep, deep time, geological time into more recent time? Or it, it, will there be a narrative? Or does your fluid many entrances mean that people can find themselves at any one moment somewhere completely surprising? Um, the latter. Um, so it's, we move away from a very strict chronology, which is the character of the museum now. And, and a museum of a place, a museum of London, has uh, three dimensions. People, of course, people make a city um, and live in it. Uh, the uh, time, how the city has developed over time and place, uh, location, the city itself, but also how, that, how a city has affected, how this city has affected the globe or is affected by the globe. And so, um, so we had to, to get our heads around this as an institution and with all of the partners, including Asif and Paul and Julian, to put some kind of intellectual structure around the, the component parts of the, of the campus, as Asif has described it. And we landed on time as the main organizing structure. Now that doesn't mean to say, and, and what it does is give us a, a style and an approach and a way of being in each of those different places, which are very different places. You know, deep time is in the basement of the general market. Imagine time is on under the roof of the poultry market, for instance. It gives us a way of being very different in all those places so that there is a different style, a different pace, a different feeling, a different expectations and things to discover in each of the different component parts of the new museum. I see if you, the architecture obviously likes to transcend its time, but it's very much of its time. How do you approach this, this, uh, this um, notion in the detailing and in the broader vision that you're implementing? Okay, well, I was thinking for the, for the benefit of the listeners, we should um, describe a little bit about Smithfield and, and how that's evolved just very quickly. You know, it's, a, it's, a, it's been London's meat market for nearly a thousand years. So uh, Dickens described it as a, a place of filth and blood and fat and foam. And it's, it's, a, mm. it's, it's a kind of visceral, uh, tough, masculine environment. You know, it's, it's a place, there are streets around there which are like Lamb Lane and, and um, uh, you know, you can imagine lambs being driven there, which they were until the Smithfield Act I don't know when that is, 1850s, to, to, sl to be slaughtered. The, the market itself, um, the built market you see there, is a kind of Victorian engineering approach to sort of sanit in a way, sanitation hygiene, right? So you sort of, um, Horace Jones was tasked with, with making these buildings, um, and uh, one of them burnt down in, um, in the 50s, which was then replaced with an, a, quite an amazing 1960s building, the poultry market. So we have, the, we have a fish market um, a general market, which was started with vegetables and then became meat, and a poultry market as part of the complex, the, the, the campus, as it were. Um, so it already is, uh, because those were built at different times and they had different uh, um, budgets uh, at the time they were, they, they, some are more, more sort of ornate than others. Uh, the, the poultry market is kind of really a, a piece of radical 60s um, uh, concrete uh, gymnastics. It's just, it's something fantastic to marvel, really. Um, and uh, uh, to the places, it's a palimpsest, really. Uh, we're, we're adding another layer. And if you think about a market building, any, any kind of market building, um, it's about um, the traders bringing their temporary stall to places. And over like a few years or 20 years that they're, that they're, that they're present, um, they have all of their kind of, uh, there's, an, there's an infrastructure and they're bringing the, the tools they need to sell things. Uh, which might be, um, you know, yeah, machinery and 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 the signage and so on. Uh, so the museum is is inherited inheriting a, a really flexible building, which 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 has in its its infrastructure the ability to change over time. What we're trying to do in the architectural detailing is is work with that, um, and we, we we have this idea that the thing the building shouldn't be frozen in time. We shouldn't sort of, uh, in a way. Uh, 
take away its core purpose, which was the ability to, to keep up with the times. So we have some ideas uh, which we're implementing, doing things like, I mean, just to, if you can picture this, the, the general market, which is one of the buildings I'm talking about, is, is roughly a square and uh, has a big internal space with market hall, covered market hall, and externally around 50 shop fronts. Um, and these are kind of facing the, the outer streets. Uh, if, you, if you know the area of Farrington Street and West Smithfield Street and Charterhouse Street. Um, so whilst they were different you know, vendors of meat, um, now we have an opportunity to turn them into something else. So this is the idea that um, the, the museum can work with partners in the future to kind of bring new offers to those places, not necessarily retail, but types of content, um, exhibitions, and so on, different ways of interacting with the public. So we've, uh, we, we've kind of made some of those shop fronts um, a, let's say, restoration of the historic material that we found on site. So it's kind of a process of archaeology. Some of them where we didn't find historic material are open for future partners to, to develop their own shop front, as it were. So that they, the, the museum has a, a changing facade, changing relationship to the street frontage. It's a, it's a high street on the move, as it were. And, uh, and others where we've done a kind of contemporary approach. So the, the, the shop fronts, which are uh, museum run, mu uh, museum uh, galleries, essentially, um, they have, we've done, we've worked with, uh, inspired by, um, some of the Victorian detailing, but try to transport that into the future as if we were um, trying to make something timeless. Mm -hmm. We've worked with glass and geometry and, you know, trying to uh, think what would Horace Jones do now in a way if he had all, the, all of these different materials at his disposal. So uh, as a visitor, I think there'll be something for everyone. You'll get a sense of the, of, of, of the Victorian architecture. You'll get a sense of this thousand years of history of the place, but also mm -hmm. like a feeling of a a look into the future and a museum that's always up with the time, kept up with the times, um, and uh, and hopefully has a voice in London, wh whichever time uh, we're talking about. The the um, the idea that you are part of the fabric of a city and you're contributing to mm. the city is clear, um, but I suppose also you want to engage with a specific context, but also you're a museum of the whole city. So privileging West Smithfield or the Square Mile or the City of London itself, which originally was the, I mean, the historic origins of the city, um, is that an issue for you? Or do you decide from the beginning that you must engage with the place around you and from that place everything emanates or gravitates towards? I mean, I like the idea of the underground train because it's a literal connectedness, isn't it? You know, Blake's yes. Underground labyrinth, labyrinth, but you see the connectedness to the city and a reminder that you're part of a you know, a bigger lab labyrinth or leviathan or entity. Sharon. Yeah, this, so what is extraordinary about this place that we're going to inhabit is it, it just feels both contemporary and very historic. And that richness is around, around the neighborhood and in the building. And this is, it, it exemplifies London. You know, the, the Smithfield, as, as, um, as Asif has described it, has been a meat market for a thousand years. Um, cattle were driven to London from as far afield as Scotland. Later, with the invention of uh, refrigeration, which is embodied in one of the buildings called the Red House, which is a cold store, it enabled um, a kind of ex imports from New Zealand, Australia, all um, Argentina, all parts of the world. So this example of the connectedness of a very small part of London to the whole globe is just one small example. Equally, in the neighborhood, before it was a, um, a, a market, this was a place of jousting. And you would have French jousters coming over to kind of to have combat with, with British nobles. It was a, the only place where you, could do, where, you, where you could see as a commoner public jousting. It was the site of the cloth fair, the great big medieval fairs. It's a place where William Wallace was hanged, drawn and quartered. It's the site of St. Bart's Hospital, the first big public hospital in the whole of Britain. So it, it's just all of that in those small examples that I've given are examples of how this very small place 
has really big implications for the whole of London, the UK, and in some senses, the world. And it is that constant interplay um, that, and that, and that um, power and resonance that London as a global city has. I want to step out of the immediate crisis. We haven't dealt with that and, and um, uh, we're dealing with it all the time. But except to say that the idea of museums for the short term having to become hyper local is very interesting. It's mm. something we happen to do at the Design Museum. I think a lot of museums will start to have to engage much more openly and actively. I hope we were doing that anyway, but with, with, their, with their local communities, which you by definition can do because any community in London is, is, is in, mm. in a sense part of that story. Um, but it is interesting what the local community is mm. in Smithfield and the city, august and important as it is, is transient or by day and working practices may be changing anyway. Even the city may spend a lot more time away from the square mile. I don't know if I'm allowed to say this in the event sponsored by the, the, the uh, mayor, but anyway, it seems to me that that's a possibility. Um, how, how, how are you thinking about engaging with local audiences or is it really, this is where you are the kind of, that's TARDIS is overstating it, but this is the place you want to attract school children, for example, from all over the city and, and, and audiences from all over the city. And you're not that engaged with who lives right around the corner. Um, we, uh, one of our ambitions, and it has been for some long, uh, some time, is to engage every London school child. There's 1.3 million of them at the moment, I think. And uh, that's a pretty big audience. And it's a kind of really important objective for us. Uh, but equally on our doorsteps in Islington, Camden, are some of the poorest communities. Um, uh, and we are there for the most empowered people who know how to access cultural uh, offers um, and people who are less empowered. And so we are really holding those things very carefully and with great intent. And, and we are being very careful and very uh, systematic in our approach to very local neighbourhoods, the Barbican Golden Estate, and then reaching out. And, and we can do this as well through, through great initiatives like Culture Miles. So there's all sorts of ways in which we are able to engage uh, and, and, um, and involve uh, people, whether they're very local or right across London. So it's, it's, a, it's an interplay all the time. And at the moment, as you know, William, I'm not William, as you know, Tim, we are completely uh, thinking uh, about this very hyper-local audience. And it gives us one of, um, if there is a benefit of this time, a real ability to be experimental and to do stuff that we haven't felt uh, confident as cultural institutions to do because we've kind of been locked into overseas tourists and incoming tourists and things like this. And it gives us this moment of real creativity, I think. I am... Um... I hope that museums become even more collegial than they've been in the past. Uh, mm. There is that attitude of, of helping each other, but it's also a cutthroat, at least ruthless business when it comes to fundraising and, and, and so on. Mm. Maybe less so with audiences, but there's an element of that. You're part of a cultural hub, and I suppose your stakeholders uh, mm. and the City of London Corporation are driving that, and as they are generous funders. I mean, I should say that you had to raise 332 million, and haven't you got about 40 million left to go? I mean, that's pretty impressive. Um, but I imagine that the stakeholders, who, uh, which would be the, the, the Lord Mayor's office and indeed the, um, the City of London Corporation, the majority, uh, are in, uh, not just encouraging it, but presumably it's a condition of, of, uh, of funding that you do link up with your other partners in, in the cultural hub and square mile. Mm. Let's talk about that. But also, um, how much will you be able to, and can we encourage you, to reach out to those of us outside the well-funded, um, deservedly well-funded square mile? And, and maybe think, you know, that you might go back to your roots in Kensington, for example, or uh, your museum roots, for example. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a, I think um, now that we have um, achieved or on the process of achieving planning permission, it's a little bit longer. Uh, uh, that will soon be confirmed. But that's brilliant. You know, this is a kind of another milestone. I think there's a real uh, there are real opportunities for us to to work across the city. Uh, and for other museums to really think about London. Sometimes I think um, it's not been, the subject of London hasn't been 
um, isn't top foremost in the minds of other big museums. So I think there's all sorts of things we can do together to explore uh, London and to think about its different dimensions, whether it's the Design Museum or Health in London with the Welcome Collection or um, kind of issues to do with maybe poverty with the Foundling Museum and so and so forth. So the Geoffrey, Mu you know, I can think of a million, uh, there's 200 museums in London. And I think there's kind of all these wonderful connections that we can make. So yes, Tim, I, I really look forward to the space now to, to kind of forge those connections. Plenty of witnesses to that remark, thank you. <laughs> I see the, uh, it's, a, um, it's an interesting idea that the hub, the, par the hub, partner hubs, including the, the Guildhall School of Music and Dance, sorry for the crass link, but I'm fascinated by the choreography of audiences and visitors to museums. How are you playing with that? And actually, are you also thinking about the journey around the square mile as well? Are you choreographing a broader sense of place too? Well, I think, so, so the, the audience know there is this, this thing called the Culture Mile, which is, a, is, a, is an initiative which uh, Sharon is heavily involved in and probably explain more about, but it's, that's about connecting this kind of string of pearls in the, in the city, including the Barbican, um, to, uh, you know, a series of institutions where people can literally promen promenade and move from one to the other. They share, their, they share events and kind of information. It's much more, let's say, user focused than it ever was. Um, so we, we have this um, shared public realm, and there's going to be a project which is, which is slowly coming to life um, and will be there for when the museum opens, which is about um, yeah, re redesigning that public realm. Um, and there's a team specifically working for that, and we're interfacing with that. So we're plugging in uh, mm -hmm. our, um, our jewel at the end of it. Ours is the, the, um, the, final, um, the final jewel of the, the Culture Mile. Um, the drowning jewel, yes. <laughs> I was going to say that, but um, uh, you, know, we, you know, we've got uh, Sharon, correct me if I'm wrong, it's something like seven million um, objects in the collection, oh, yeah. I think, oh. something like that. It's, it's enormous. Um, the idea also that this, the new location, uh, you know, which was outside of the area that burnt down in the fire of London. So, you know, there's a lot of old, old London remaining there. Um, the, the collection is, is broader now because it's part, the city has become part of the collection. So, you know, the idea of these seven million objects starting to kind of percolate out through the city, whether it's through, you know, along that culture mile or the distributed, um, uh, let's call it a kind of a, a school, basically. It's a way of learning about the city by walking through it. Uh, it's very exciting. So that, what I kind of um, have been thinking about is concentric circles. And you, 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 you leave Barbican Station or the Crossrail platform, and therefore, at that moment, you get your first sort of taste of, I'm work, walking towards a museum. It might be with signage, or it might be the William Wallace uh, Memorial, mm -hmm. and you move closer, and you see signage towards a lecture that's about to happen that evening. Okay, I'll stop back in, and, and, and that's the Poultry Market Lecture Hall. And then you arrive at West Poultry Avenue, which is where the entrance to the museum will be. And, uh, and there you might grab a coffee at the Cocoa Rooms or, or Cocoa at the Cocoa Rooms, which is a, being a kind of uh, discovery that uh, Julian Harrop made on site, kind of one of the first, uh, one of the last um, uh, kind of Cocoa, literally kind of, a, it's like a Cocoa Tavern. You know, it's part of this movement, which was to get people off alcohol and onto uh, sort of uh, to imbibe less and to be more, more productive in their lives. So kind of a bit, you know, so, uh, you have that and you, you meet someone there in the morning, you go into this general market uh, and, and uh, you know, you might catch a performance or kind of, uh, there might be something that's part of the collection that you've donated to the museum yourself. This is about our time um, mm. before going into the basement and all. So you, you are, um, you, you seamlessly walk from, from London as you know it to sort of London where you are the, you're not a participant, you're a kind of, you, you become, Engage and you're, you're almost a performer in the whole thing. So this, uh, I guess this sort of um, uh, journey is something we, we really want to make special and tantalizing. And, you know, we, uh, yeah, we're working, the team is enormous actually, like in terms of uh, mm -hmm. architecture, but there's another layer, which is exhibition design and curation. Uh, and, and that will really bring, that will really bring the place to life. And there's a whole nother layer we're going to be working on over the next, uh, the coming years. 
Uh, the building itself has signage on it where we're exploring, taking inspiration from kind of Victorian lettering that used to be, architectural lettering that used to be on buildings in the area. And that itself is a canvas for art, which is, you know, uh, you'll, you'll see come to life in, in 2024. Uh, the way the museum itself has a voice, not, not just signage saying I'm the museum, but the museum might be saying, uh, the museum might say Black Lives Matter at this moment, and it will be plastered on the museum, for example. The museum might be telling us about uh, 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 future ideas it has for living together or for working together or so on. So the, the, um, the opportunities here, it's all about flexibility and moving with the times and kind of projecting ahead. Um, the architecture has to be able to move and not be stuck. So this is, this is, this is the, the vehicle that we're trying to give to Sharon. Mm. What, what are the museum models or the inspirations um, that uh, have fed into the museum? Because obviously you don't create a museum in a vacuum. You've got the previous museum that you've been working on. I love your mention of 1947 and the United Nations building. I was thinking of David Chipperfield's work in Berlin, actually, and those the, the various museums from the Neues Museum, wonderful restoration, activation of space, the interplay with different institutions that are separate but connected. Um, where have you been looking and where do you think the best and most exciting examples are and, and those which you've learned from in direct and indirect ways? Is that to... to um, yeah, to you, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, sorry. yeah um, we, we visited the, uh, the whole Museum Island complex in Berlin, actually. So we've, we've gone around with Sharon and um, Paul, uh, Stanford Williams Architects and, and, and Julian Harrop and some of the other members from the curatorial team. We've been, we've been going around... Uh, experiencing how people do it um, and uh, you know things that personally have, have had a strong effect on me are places much further afield you know for example the pier 2 art center in in kaohsiung in taiwan i think it's a fantastic um, um renovation of the kind of um uh, dockside area into into an art district and that's that for me is a great great uh, piece of work that um uh, we should think about for Culture Mile. Um, I think um, the project which, um, uh, you know, again, Kenya, Kenya Haro, who I noticed is joining the chat, so I'm, I'm sort of mentioning this because I saw his name there, but um, he's done a sort of a, a rebranding of uh, one of the districts of Beijing. Um, and, and that's about kind of a, making, ev making everyone who's in that district feel they're part of something greater, making it feel that it's part of the campus and using that signage and wayfinding and so on. Um, in the, in the building itself, um, uh, I think, the, of course, the biggest um, similar project there is in London is, 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 is the whole complex around the DNA. So the, the, if, you, if you remember um, how that evolved over time, it was originally um, a sort of a, a large complex which, which was created after the, the Great Exhibition of 1851. 1852, 1851, I <laughs> It's one, and 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 sort of this this, this collection, but also a, 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 almost the, the, the place. Uh, the idea was it become a kind of seat of learning. The idea that it's a university, so it changes the relationship, um, uh, rather than just collecting and showing information to dispersing and educating and creating research. And I I think um, what what Sharon's created is a possibility for this museum to have a very different. Um, approach to using its collection and by weaving together new networks, new ways of engaging with the audience, this becomes a, a sort of a pilot project for how cities can be in the future. So we, we talked the subject of this conversation is kind of um, the museum of the future or what, you know, designing a museum of the future for London. And I think um, it's about manifesting those ideals in the same way that people did, you know, these great projects 150 years ago. That, that, that manifesto, um, and what we, what we have to do is to kind of bake that into the architecture so that can, that can actually be brought to life. Um, uh, but yeah, this, so this, you know, the, the, the inspiration is from, from really, really broad. It's, and it's the idea of 360 degree curation, you know, that the, the building itself is, a, is an artifact, but everything that you bring in, including yourself and the food that you eat there is also and art is also part of the collection, you know, that's, that's the, uh, if you're eating, you know, uh, I might be a visitor from, uh, from uh, you know, the United States coming there, but I might be able to have a, the taste of a home-cooked meal from an Indian family 
uh, and I've suddenly connected, who, who came to London in 1960, suddenly you've connected to, to my history or East African India, you know. So it, there's all these different ways that the, story, the building can come to life. And it's, it's in a way that um, I don't think anyone could, have, could imagine if you visit there right now, it's, 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 it's almost silent, dormant, and it's waiting for something to happen like this. Mm -hmm. Karen. And I just, I just want you to listen carefully to what Asif has just said about cuisine. This is his big idea that we are going to put in the museum. It is so brilliant. So um, I, we want the museum to be open, re, um, kind of baked in from the beginning, every Friday and Saturday night, open really late into the night for everybody. Uh, um, and one of the big ideas is to have a big open table uh, that, that presents the food cooked. And in this case, I think, sorry, Asif's mum, but Asif has just put you forward to be the first yeah. person whose menu we will, who, who you will cook it. I don't know, maybe Asif will give you a hand. And for everybody who wants to come that <laughs> night. <laughs> um, and and we, so, we all took, so we'll be able to connect, as I have said, and this is what's so exquisite, you know, it's, in, it's people, people's experiences, uh, the things they produce, the food they eat, and share it with everybody else around a, a story, around a family or around an individual, her life, why she's created this recipe, why this recipe, what it means, and we'll all have the joy of sharing it. And this is, feels such, that's, that's the essence of what, what this museum will be about. I mean, the idea about it reflecting the diversity of London, which is one of the most culturally and ethnically diverse cities in the world. I love the idea that literally people will be eating or devouring aspects of that, of that uh, diversity. Um, I, I just want to pick up there, Sharon, on, you know, as he was, uh, was, was candid and wide ranging in, in inspiration. Um, I, I, want to, I want to know what, where you think the best or most exciting museums have been that you've taken inspiration from. And also, I do want to also push you on the kind of museum you don't want. I mean, you don't have to mention particular museums. Or really I, I, I can do that really easily, yeah. actually, the yeah. kind of museum I don't want. Yeah. I don't want you to feel when you come into the museum that somehow you are in a seat of uh, incredible learning that you uh, have, uh, that you find discombobulating and it's not really the place for you. Uh, this is not about showing how much uh, academics know, it's about exploring together. So there's, so there's that. Um, I don't want it to be a museum that uses digital interactivity for the sake of it. I don't want a museum that has flaps or levers. Uh, I don't want a museum that, um, because flaps and levers are, are boring, actually. I want- Well, they break uh, and everyone else can wants to get involved in them. And it I yeah, and, and you just open a flap. Uh, <laughs> it can flap off. Um, you, <laughs> I, it, but it really needs to, to take people to new places and to really, really sh shake us in some way, either emotionally, intellectually. It really it is not an easy museum. It shouldn't be easy, but it should be effective. Anyway, so uh, where, and, and then if you say, well, what are the best museums? I always come back to the kind of amazing experiences that have taken me to new places. So if I think about a very simple thing, the Big Pit Museum in Wales, which is an act, uh, which is an old coal mine, um, but you go into the essence of a place taken there by coal, coal miners. And so that combination with the stories and the kind of, you know, and all of that stuff in the kind of griminess of it all is a, fa is a fantastic experience. The, um, I, I love the Carnival Aids. It's currently being refurbished in, um, in uh, Paris. And that's because it's filled with extraordinary stuff. So there is a place for lots of stuff. And I think humans are connected and love stuff. Um, and I, and I, love, um, I, love, 
I, I did, I really enjoyed the Noises Museum uh, in Berlin, uh, which was extraordinary. But also there's places like when we went to Paris, um, Saint Catra, which isn't a museum, it's a, it's a, a centre that has meaning in that particular district, filled with life, used by all generations, extraordinary. So there's a whole load of experiences to pack into this museum. We're ready to take questions fairly soon. So while, while we're lining up the first question, I, I want to ask you a, a final question, uh, brief, but it's a big oh. one, which is two or three years after the opening, let's say 2026, 27, um, what will success look like? What, I mean, you may say it's in numbers actually, the engagement, but how will both of you measure success? Okay, I'll go for um, that. It's been kind of taken over by other ideas. You know, that other things have happened that we couldn't have envisaged now. Um, that the nooks and crannies have become populated with interesting stuff. That um, we've been able to have the first exhibition uh, about Adele. Uh, that we have. Um, you know, done a, done a great exhibition about food of London where everyone's eaten the food. I don't know. Um, it's, uh, it, it, it will be to do with, has it continued to live and evolve? And therefore, is are oh, all parts of London, when I go into the museum, does it feel like London? This is one of our mantras. Does it feel like London? Is this London? When you walk into the museum and you look at everybody and you see what's happening and you can say to yourself, this really is London. I see briefly, I mean, success like with Sharon described it, people are going to be absolutely stuffed. They'll have devoured <laughs> food from everywhere. Um, but I think she means also intellectually and spiritually stuffed as well. But how, what's success like for you? I think it's a, a, the idea that it's, that it's an unfinished like it's an unfinished work that will always be evolving. I think, you know, Sharon's already mentioned that. And every, you know, you come back um, six months later and new things are there. And, you know, pe people have used the infrastructure in new ways. Uh, this, is, this is really exciting. I think for me to see that we've put the thing in motion, uh, you know, begun the sentence and other people have come in and completed mm. it, uh, mm. it's, it's so exciting. Uh, and it's not really about design then, it's about a movement. And so this idea that the that original, I, the original manifesto that Sharon's that Sharon has this sort of vision for the museum um, is absorbed by the building and by Londoners and Londoners get it. They kind of know what they they can go there for and they go and hang out there because there'll be something interesting. It's worth worth passing by. And if you if you land in London, of course, uh, from from overseas, you've got Farringdon Station is connected to every airport now. You mm. know, with Crossrail. So it could be the first thing that you drop off at. So, you know, I, I want to be able to say to somebody who's, who's flying in, you know what, uh, bring your luggage, I'll see you at the museum, and we're going we're gonna, to, uh, you know, have lunch there, and then let's go and see the rest of London, you know. Then, you know, that's, that's a, the beginning of the journey, you know, that would be fantastic. I, I like the idea of uh, letting the viewer complete the sentence. We should let our um, audience have a chance to chat. Uh, we're going to put faith in technology. It's been pretty good so far. Uh, I, I can see that Lucy, uh, Lucy Branchick is ready to ask a question. I don't know if I'm waiting to see her appear. Here she is, Lucy, great. Hi. Far Hi. away, thank you. Uh, so I worked uh, for uh, exhibition, exhibition design agencies for about the last 12 years. And earlier in the conversation, you talked about how the curatorial team and the architects were working together on the collections and the collections requirements and the spaces. Um, I've seen that you've just started to think about the exhibition designers and put out a, a sort of initial tender um, like beginnings for that but mm -hmm. after the architects were brought on board and I just wanted to know was it a conscious de decision to bring on the exhibition designers later or right like, rather than at the same time or before and why was that because my experience um, working in that sector was that different museums seem to take very different approaches and in some venues we were responsible for writing the master plans and briefing the architects and working very closely with the curatorial teams and in others we were brought on after building amendments were already in progress. 
Great. Let's let's answer that. Thank you so much, um, Sharon. Do you want to answer that first? Yeah. Um, uh, we we knew our need was to get our architectural team and the design team around the the campus, working on the buildings, helping us to refine that vision. And and as you have probably picked up, we're working with very intelligent designers who get the whole story. And it's so they so Asif and Paul and Julian and the rest of the architectural team, design team, really bring sentiments about design and ex exhibitions and and kind of uh, really understand that well, I think. So that gives us the confidence to then bring on our uh, exhibition designers and we and we will have different approaches to that. So we have appointed Atelier Bruckner to do um, the exhibit, the, um, the more narrative galleries in past time. And they've been working on that for over a year now. We work with Ralph Applebaum uh, to uh, create a kind of um, uh, an interpretation master plan and an intellectual plan right at the beginning. And they were locked into the process. And now we will start to procure other designers. But a part of our principle around this um, has always been how do we bring up new talent? How do we create new partnerships between organizations? Um, and how, how do we get the very, you know, it's not necessarily, it's definitely not one big uh, interpretation, exhibition design team to do all of it because it will become too uh, homogenous in its response to the content. I see if you've been described as an intelligent designer, of course you are, mm -hmm. but it'd be great. I mean, Sharon wouldn't describe our architectural team as stupid, would she? Um, but, but that sensitivity that you bring and your range of experiences that involve, you've been involved in exhibition making and installation. Um, how has that, that played out in relationship to Lucy's question? Uh, yeah, I think, I think firstly, I gravitate towards the objects in the collection. They're just, I, if, you, if you get a chance, and this is, message to everyone listening to visit Mortimer Wheeler House, mm. make an appointment, do a tour around it. And it's a, it's a free, it's a place you can go to. It's, it's a place where the entire collection of the Museum of London is stored or most of it. And uh, they'll give you a tour around there. Um, and you'll, you'll, you, it's, it's like a, um, uh, it's archeology. span I mean, you, it's, it's like stepping back in time and you see these, you know, just amazing from jelly molds, <laughs> from brass <laughs> jelly molds, to, um, to um, uh, you know, even fake, fake Victorian um, 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 valuable um, ceramics and things. The, fake, the fakes themselves have become artifacts mm. that are valuable. Um, and uh, so, you know, we, I sort of begin there with a the fascination for, for, for the object itself, but then um, the building is so complex and the, this, this, this team, this amazing team, Paul and Julian and AKT, the engineers, and Arup, the kind of uh, um, uh, environmental engineers, uh, and, and more, we, we, we've been trying to kind of um, stabilize and decipher and, um, and kind of make good that building, which was a real derelict, and also to try to get it to, um, to cohabit with this live train line that's mm. tunneling underneath uh, in, in a safe and comfortable way. Um, so the challenge of bringing on um, uh, exhibition designers at those early stages, it's almost too much information and it's too mm. complex a project for them to even get involved in. Yeah. Um, so we've, we've got now to the point that almost, okay, we know how big it is. We know it's safe. We know how it's primarily how we bring electricity and lighting in. We know um, we've got a whole kind of vision for the architectural spaces. Um, and, and, you know, with Bruckner's and, and, and hopefully these other people, that will come on board, um, other designers, we, we can begin to tailor each of the spaces mm -hmm. to the requirements of the objects and in terms of lighting and in terms of uh, environmental control and, and so on. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I also, you know, to tell the truth, at the beginning, I was like, oh God, we should just design everything. We, you know, <laughs> it should be one vision and should be, you know, we should do it and it should all be one color and da -da -da -da, you know, all of this. Um, Actually, I, I agree with Sharon completely. And it's, it's been a, a process of, of, of realization of, God, that would be boring. There's an opportunity here 
to represent so many different points of view uh, and uh, and different eras, you know, in London's history. And having a, having a um, having a, an, a different author uh, mm. in each of those it's so interesting. It's like it's like reading a, a Peter Ackroyd biography of London um, uh, and then reading like a Will Self description of London. It's you know so different. And then like a Samuel Pepys, having these different authors. Um, uh, uh, you know, and then imagine like a, a Benjamin Zephaniah London, how he would tell the story. And that's mm. the same the exhibition designers can bring to it. And I think this, um, it's just, it's just very exciting that how, to see how those will speak to each other and how mm. visitors, each visitor will have something that suits them and feels comfortable for them. And this is, this is very exciting. Um, Multiplicity of voices. I want to bring other voices in there. Th Lucy, thank you. It was a very good question and we went deep into it. Or as Ethan Sharon did. And we've got Ted Hiscox now uh, on the line. Ted, uh, are you ready to ask your question? We're just waiting for you to come up. Oh, you've been waiting. Can, for can you hear me? Yes. We can hear you, yeah. Can you see me perhaps as well? We yes, thank you. Um, I'm not sure if your risk register includes COVID 19, but are you planning to ensure that the designs address the challenges of pandemics? Do, do you mean. Um, do you mean uh, as a narrative or uh, phys physically? Physically. Um, well, currently we're deep in understanding what that actually means at the moment. Um, as we are trying to manage the reopening of the Museum of London at London Wall. So um, how you create space for people, how you create... Um, sanitizing, hand sanitizing situations and so on and so forth. So we will learn from that. I don't know what we will take from this to physically implement in the design of the new museum. That's a live and active question at the moment. Thank you very much. I might, I might add to that. I mean, I, I spoke about this kind of great hidden mm. space of London. The, the main hall of the general market is, I said, one of London's great treasures. It's the size of Oxford Circus. It's an indoor space the size of Oxford Circus. So um, distancing from each other, if that, if that is a continued requirement, would be very easy in that space. Yeah, and also I like the fact that you, I mean, you, you, you dealt with the, the, the realities of now, but of course, in your narrative, London has suffered pandemics. I mean, the plague mm. is, a, is a pivotal mm. moment, isn't it, in the, yeah. in the history? So this will become part of that history as well as how we use, presumably, the flexible and fluid approaches you're taking to design yeah. to try and find a way forward if, if, if we're in this situation again. Um, thanks very much, uh, Ted. There's a, the, a guy is now on the line, I think. Um, I, think it, I think it's a man called Guy, not a guy called Guy. Guy, are you there? Sorry, um, are we just waiting for your question? We can, we can, I don't know if this is the question about funding. <laughs> I hope it is. Um, no, this guy there, I'll try and find them. Um, I suppose, um, just picking up on the last question before I can <coughs> find Guy's question. The, um, you can't as a museum director and, and as an architect plan for all eventualities, but presumably you have enough time before 2024 to take on board some of the lessons that museums will have to learn from the current situation that, in which they find themselves about not just the flexible working, but how you can get audiences through in different ways um, and open a museum up and not be dependent on the model of hundreds or thousands of visitors every day and the economics of a museum really rise or fall with that kind of model. Presumably you're looking at a more sustainable model anyway, mm -hmm. I hope so, given the funding that you have. Yeah, I mean, the, the kind of, the, of course, we are, we benefit from being a free museum because we are funded by the Corporation of London and the GLA and Arts Council as our kind of sponsoring bodies. Our, uh, so, so our commitment is to remain free apart from for special exhibitions, maybe other sorts of events. Um, so our economic model um, needs to kind of flex around that, you know, that's the kind of framework for our economic model at the moment. Um, 
I, I really don't know what we will learn from COVID, apart from the fact that I now know we can engage audiences remotely in a way like we've never done before. I also know that people love objects and the connection with the real thing is extraordinary. Um, and exhibitions, I think, will continue to be a thing. No, I, I could be replaced by digital. Couldn't agree with you more. We we need yeah. communal experiences of visceral, physical things collectively. Mm -hmm. it's, one of, it's one of the, the great human drives, I think, it, it, mediated and mod modified in, in certain ways, but still fundamental. Um, we have a, 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 our questioner up, um, on on the line. Is this Lucy? Yes. Lucy, um, thank you. My question, I think, follows on a little bit, perhaps, from the other one about funding. Um, which is about this, you've got this fantastic democratic vision that sounds, I mean, it sounds absolutely brilliant. Um, I know from all the work that I've done with other museums that when it comes to looking for funding, looking at benefactors, patrons, all of those sorts of issues, then that isn't such a democratic mix of people, is it? That tends to be a top slice of the, the wealthy, the successful, um, doesn't look much like the general population of London. How are you going to kind of manage that situation to make sure that your really powerful vision doesn't get kind of diluted towards something safer that is perhaps more fundable by people that are more conservative? Well, the kind of really, you know, we've raised, we have raised through philanthropic means so far, 27 million pounds. The vision that I have talked about today, uh, and Asif has been in the room for some of those conversations, as have Paul Williams and Julian Harrop and others is as compelling to the people who have more money than I can even imagine um, as it is to us. And that's why they're funding this museum. And I think there are other people out there who really feel the same. And in fact, we now know and you see the what you, we've seen the way trust foundations and individuals who have the ability to donate to causes have pivoted towards the urgent need that is kind of very evident today, you know, this year in the past month. And so um, I I feel very confident of um, that people are buying into this vision. And frankly, you know, when um, we make collecting decisions such as reaching out to the people, the, the collective who created the baby Trump limp and said, we want that in our collection, that's not turned any donors off. That's who we are as a museum. When we, because, you know, and, and on and on and on it goes. So that's, that's who we are, that's what we do. And actually that is compelling to people. But I don't think we'll only be fundraising from the very rich either. I, I, how do we enable people to make whatever contribution they can and feel really great about it? And it's about kind of how we give to the future. Well, perhaps it'll diversify the participation in the kind of funding as well. Yeah, could be, could be. Thank I'm you. into that, says a museum director, desperately searching mm. for money at this critical time. Mm. Lucy, thank you. Um, we've got uh, another question. Ah, great. Sonia. Sonia Solikari. Thank you. Over to you. Hello. Hi, Sharon and Asif. Hi. Um, so I'm going to ask this question from a place of anxiety myself, reaching the end of a capital development project at the Museum of the Home. Um, and that is, it seems that from the planning phase of a capital project through to delivery, the cultural landscape can change so much that it's almost when you reopen, you feel immediately old fashioned, I suppose. And I, and I wondered if you've tackled that, the idea of agility throughout the planning process so that you can open seeming dynamic and relevant, even though you've been 10 years in the planning. I, I think it's, uh, it goes back to what Asif said about the unfinished sentence. You know, if this is always in process, we never finish, we should never ossify, you know, but we all know that, you know, when you create a permanent gallery, it has a particular lifespan. How do we build in dynamism into that? But all the range of components, I think it is the unfinished sentence. 
Yeah. It's, in, it's interesting, Asif, because you made the point to me, uh, not uh, it, when we were talking about museums in general, but particularly the Museum of London, that you, you felt that you were also representing your generation and your cultural milieu, as well as being the architect in, in, in the museum, which, which I suppose speaks to the point about, um, about a, a, a broad audience. But the notion of funding and funding in some ways being agreed, but then certain things have to be left out, decisions have to be made on the basis of economics. Um, the picture you both painted is that you haven't had to do too much of that. You haven't had to cut your cloth too much. Now, maybe I've over overinterpreted that, mm -hmm. but, but I, good, there's a wry smile there. Mm -hmm. But I wonder whether this fluidity um, in a sense uh, is, is facilitated by a, a gen generous funding already in place. And eventually you're going to have to finalise things in a more compromised way if, if there becomes a further problem with, with funding or no more funding is available or you decide, discover that things are going to cost a huge amount more. Oh. Like, should I, should I, I mean, no, Sharon, go ahead. No, you go, you go. <laughs> From a design perspective, there's... Um, firstly, the, the building exists already. It's a, it's, a, it's a very unusual circumstance. For, for, for a new, for a cultural institution to be moving into a building that, that already is physically there. So there's a lot of things that you can, you can sort of think about and test, test because it's phys the physical, um, the thought experiment, experiment isn't so difficult actually. Um, and uh, as from a design perspective, there's actually a great pleasure in, um, in removing elements from the design and, and um, realizing that you, that, you, right at the beginning, you put in a lot of ingredients, and then you discover that there's certain flavors in there aren't doing much. Mm. And actually, you just need these these kind of three or four spices, and you just need that to go with it, and you need uh, to dilute it a certain amount. And, and then, and then you, you're leaving the canvas open for for other things to plug in in in, in the future. And so, we've um, the, as I, I sort of made out earlier, the building is, is is very complex, very large, and in quite a difficult um, uh, um, state of repair. Um, and so, uh, although it's a large budget, as, as, as has been made out already, it's actually a lot of that money is spent making the building good and sort of looking after the, the asset that we're inheriting. Um, so we're, we're trying to, to be really deft in our approach design-wise to, to not uh, squander uh, money, to do the, do the uh, we think about the durability and resilience and, and this kind of time life cycle um, that's needed for different parts of the, the building. Um, but uh, to try to think, um, I think to, to, to take a leaf out of the kind of Victorian's book, there's certain areas that you would, you spend a lot of money and you need um, like robustness and strength in certain areas where you know you're going to develop and change it over time. And we've, we've tried to kind of balance that. I think it certainly hasn't been a project where um, it's an unlimited um, um, uh, pool of money and just do whatever you want. It's something we have to be incredibly careful. And we are swapping bits around continuously. Mm. Um, yeah, we've, it's, 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 it's great fun as well to be working, to be working like that, uh, uh, to, to kind of perfecting the recipe. Perhaps I was being mischievous in suggesting that it was uh, so, so vast you could do almost what you wanted. I love the fact that twice in that answer you managed to get cooking analogies in again you're obsessed both of them. <laughs> right Sonia thank you um thank you we've got another thank you so much we've got a question from Hani uh, Cara I think is Hani's waiting to come in uh, if we can have his question um that's our engineer Hani is our uh, engineer Hani great okay over to you I, I've been told to keep it short I had I had first a very long one which is what would we do without culture and we've learned more mm. in the last three months than ever before I think I would have been elsewhere six feet under if I had enough art and music to play You've with. You've given it. a very succinct answer to your question. So my question to Asif directly and to the client, to the client is about the wider question of the healing power as I've just described of culture, but to Asif is the graveyard is full of uh, brilliant young architects whose dream was to design a museum and then, then they do nothing else ever. How are oh. you going to prevent that? <laughs> He's got a good portfolio already, but let's see him answer this one. What I what I, what I hope um, 
is that this museum or this process that I've gone through firstly inspires others from, from younger generations, other young architects, other people who, who, who didn't get those opportunities um, uh, to, to look for them and, and, and to, to believe that they can um, work on projects like this. And I think it also to clients to, uh, to work with architects that, um, that don't have the big name, that don't have a, uh, um, you know, not super famous and not, you know, huge offices. They, there's, there's, um, there's ways of involving the, the um, younger um, and uh, more diverse voices in the production of, in the production of the city. Uh, and I think it's vital in order to transform, uh, for the city to be closer to reflecting its inhabitants, that there are more voices um, designing in it. Um, I think it's, it's very difficult, yeah, being part of a project like this, um, a, a, a great, enormous project. It's like winning the 100 meters and then and the world record, you're saying, Bolt, where'd you go once you've done that? <laughs> you know, do you start doing football? Uh, I, I think there's, um, I'm very interested in, um, in, in how I can bring what I've learned here and that is working with a client very closely, working with many stakeholders, complex institutions, complex architecture, engineering, and transport that into, uh, into other um, sectors. Because I was thinking, you know, what would a hospital be like if, if we had a chance to design a building uh, like in the way, same process we've taken? You know, it would be somewhere where old people and young people and maybe university could be mixed in with this. And it, I think I think there's a, an opportunity for a renaissance here, and the museum is feels like a template uh, for, for 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 new forms of institutes, maybe new forms of housing, um, and uh, and I think new forms of education as well. And it's going to be full of young people. Uh, you know, my kids already go to the Museum of London as part of their curriculum. Uh, imagine if they turn into dreamers um, and, and they're inspired to create architecture in a city of tomorrow. Uh, what, you know, what would that city look like? That's what I'm interested in, how I can help that generation uh, build something really bright and really fantastic uh, for the Annie, future. Thanks, Annie. That was a great question. It's a really nice answer. I can see you, the idea of the campus and the hospital. Um, you'd spent most of the talk before I'm making a pitch to design restaurants, but this is, uh, mm. this, this is more <laughs> yeah. um, we Kate Birch is uh, ready to ask a question. Kate, over to you. Hi, yes. Um, you've been talking about diversity. You mentioned Black Lives Matter. Um, my question is more, the, it, will the design and the cultural tour, will it allow the museum to, for example, celebrate the coffee houses while at the same time acknowledging for, that the Royal Africa Company, which controlled the slave trade, was just around the corner? I think sometimes these things just become um, footnotes. And in fact, it needs to be something particularly with the second great wave that we're going through at the moment. I think it's really important that something like this does actually acknowledge not only the people who started Lloyd's, but the people who were basically trading in human beings. Yeah, I mean, I feel very confident with my, our curatorial team, but also it's not just, you know, we have an academic panel who are helping steer, steer this, and we're looking for the inputs of many, many different people. So I think, um, you know, you know, uh, and we and also we need to understand more you know what are you know the absolute you know the deep roots of the city of london to this to this issue and so there is more to do there is more to learn there is more to expose and understand that connectedness that web the wealth of of britain and how it formed and um so I feel confident and um, the teams are working on it all now. And it's, you know, if you, you know, the kind of, we have to be able to tell all of the stories. This is not just a celebration of London. This is a kind of interrogation and understanding. It has to be. And we might do that in different ways, you know, either through, you know, particular, certainly particular objects, galleries, stories, um, or in whole exhibitions, temporary exhibitions that will come and go, um, or more journalistic ways. So I think it kind of, we have a kind of range of mechanisms by which we can do this. Um, yeah, yeah, you can't, this is, this is not going away. 
Excellent. It's not, and it's a critical issue, and a lot of us in the museum world know we need to do more. Um, I'm confident that, that you will, Sharon, but in a sense, you've got less excuse than many because you've got this great opportunity. No. I, can see, I can see that you're up there. I see, did you want to um, respond briefly? Uh, actually, it's, it's a, it's, it was sort of a non-architectural point in a way, but sort of stepping on uh, curatorial teams a little bit. I, I think there's, we, we once had this challenge, uh, we had it last year, where we were asked to design an exhibition for the De New Samlung, which is the design museum in, in Munich. And it was, a, it was the first time a collection of African ceramics, um, which was owned by the, which was owned by the previous, um, uh, which was owned by the kind of the Duke of Bavaria, the first time for that to be shown in a design museum. So it's taken out of the ethnographic museum context, which is sort of a, you know, overdone and kind of disappointing way for to display objects of design and aesthetics, but putting it in design context. And what was interesting is it, it was very, very challenging for, for visitors to see it in a, in, in a new light. And they found themselves, um, like it, it it was a um, the work was presented as it was as it was an exhibition of of, um, of design ceramics. It wasn't presented um, mm. in any other way. So it allowed it allowed people to form new new um, opinions of their own. And the discussion around it was was really tough. People were there because um, it also involved in it's stuff from the last 150 years, really, um, across the whole continent. Um, I think if, if Sharon and her team can make really bold, um, uh, which I think they will, really bold approaches to curation that, um, that bring, uh, unite objects that previously weren't together and ask questions and demand the audience to discuss and form their own opinions. And I think we're just providing the arena for those discussions. The architecture allows those, to ha those things to happen. Um, and it gives, a, it gives a voice to the objects that, that, um, that maybe wasn't there before. So, um, I think we shouldn't hide behind our histories. I think um, we're, we're really, as a participant in the project, I feel really confident in this, that the, the team we're working with, the curatorial team, will attack it head on and, uh, and the audience is demanding it. So we're, I think we'll, it will be something really, uh, um, we'll create a lot of thought and, and new, new perspectives, I think. Watch this space, as they say. We've come to the end. We're bang on time. I really appreciate both of you, your candor. I really appreciate the questions too. What was that remark that you gave us from Dickens? Filth and blood and fat and foam. Doesn't mean much of that in the discussion, but the idea that we're not going to hide from it, I think, is is, is underpinned. Um, before we close, uh, John Stadzinski is going to uh, say a few words in, in wrap up. John, thank you and the Genesis Foundation for your support of uh, these conversations and this one in particular. It's been an enlightening pleasure for me to take part and to moderate it. Um, over to you, John. Um, yes. Um, it's, uh, you know, in listening to this stimulating discussion, uh, I'm minded of the fact that um, William, Rebecca, and Anna, when we started talking about these cultural conversations uh, almost a year ago, we had no idea that we would all be subject to uh, a very, very sort of big sort of shock in terms of the virus, the recession, and a series of other domestic and global um, shocks um, that have really had a big impact on all of us. Listening to the discussion today with respect to the museum, the City of London Museum, Museum of London, and the future of museums, uh, I think has stimulated us all to think about a couple of things. Um, I'm minded of the fact that in the last four months, we've sort of experienced uh, what the world might look like in 2025 or 2030 in terms of the relationship between mm -hmm. culture, technology, and the lack of humanity. Uh, and I think we've all been videoed to death <laughs> and we've had enough of culture and video and the sort of uh, sterile, sort of two-dimensional side of that. And uh, Sharon's comment about touching objects, uh, uh, Hanif's comment about being six foot under, mm -hmm. the fact that audiences like to sit next to each other in theaters and concert halls, and the fact that when we're in a museum, we like to watch other people's reactions to the same experience. So we have experienced a lot. and. Uh, one of the things I'm mindful of, the acceleration of the good is getting even better. Uh, but having said that, the acceleration of the bad is getting even worse. So the world is changing at a faster rate. Uh, and I'm very grateful to William 
for this initiative because it's these conversations are actually we're all going to look back on these and see that they're a lot more timely than we thought when they were originally conceived and i'm extremely grateful that william as lord mayor has agreed to stay on uh yet another year uh and I'm, I'm also uh, delighted that we're gonna continue from a Genesis perspective at supporting these discussions, um, because I think it's this type of content, and I just wanna echo the fact, I'm not gonna replay the wonderful content that, that Tim, Sharon, and Asif have described here, but this is all about content. It is about cultural memory, and it is about protecting and preserving cultural memory as part of our legacy, and I'm just, very proud, having lived in London now for 40 years, that this is really very much the center of the world in terms of the human condition. And um, we will be better throughout this crisis as a result of this, and we're gonna to have to learn a lot of lessons. Uh, and we're not there yet in terms of the evolution of culture and where we go from culture. Um, technology is gonna be a big part of it, but then we have to not take the human condition for granted. So with the human condition in mind, I hand this back to Tim. John, thank you. You've got your strap line there, Sharon. The Museum yeah. of the Centre of the World, or the Museum <laughs> of London. Um, John, uh, your point about us coming together, um, I, I think both Sharon and Asif have managed to transcend digital technology, but I absolutely take your point. And the next conversation, the third one, which is scheduled for the 30th of September, Philanthropy in the Arts, that they're, they're, we're all hoping that there will be a much closer sense of physicality and that the, contrib the contributors may come together there. Um, the chat room's going to stay open for a few more minutes so the audience can converse with each other, but I want to end the former part of this talk by thanking Sharon Armand and, and Asif Khan again. John and William, thanks for your support too, and the rest of you have a very good evening. Thank you. <laughs>